This is the service for Good Friday. We begin with the words of Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? I have cried desperately for help, but still it does not come. During the day I call to you, my God, but you do not answer. I call at night, but get no rest. But you are enthroned as the Holy One, the one whom Israel praises. Our ancestors put their trust in you. They trusted you and you saved them. They called to you and escaped from danger. They trusted you and were not disappointed. But I am no longer a human being. I am a worm, despised and scorned by everyone. All who see me make fun of me. They stick out their tongues and shake their heads. You relied on the Lord, they say. Why doesn't he save you? If the Lord likes you, why doesn't he help you? It was you who brought me safely through birth. And when I was a baby, you kept me safe. I have relied on you since the day I was born. And you have always been my God. Do not stay away from me. Trouble is near and there is no one to help. Many enemies surround me like bulls. They are all around me, like fierce bulls from the land of Bashan. They open their mouths like lions roaring and tearing at me. My strength is gone, gone like water spilled on the ground. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like melted wax. My throat is as dry as dust and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You have left me for dead in the dust. An evil gang is around me, like a pack of dogs they close in on me. They tear at my hands and my feet. All my bones can be seen. My enemies look at me and stare. They gamble for my clothes and divide them among themselves. O oh Lord, don't stay away from me. Come quickly to my rescue. Save me from the sword. Save my life from these dogs. Rescue me from these lions. I am helpless before these wild bulls. I will tell my people what you have done. I will praise you in their assembly. Praise him, you servants of the Lord. Honour him, you descendants of Jacob. Worship him, you people of Israel. He does not neglect the poor or ignore their suffering. He does not turn away from them, but answers when they call for help. In the full assembly, I will praise you for what you have done. In the presence of those who worship you, I will offer the sacrifices I promised. The poor will eat as much as they want. Those who come to the Lord will praise him. May they prosper forever. All nations will remember the Lord. From every part of the world they will turn to him. All races will worship him. The Lord is king and he rules the nations. All proud people will bow down to him. All mortals will bow down before him. Future generations will serve him. They will speak of the Lord to the coming generation. People not yet born will be told the Lord saved his people. Let us pray. As the journey of Holy Week comes to the point of sacrifice, Lord Jesus, we gather around the foot of the cross to think of what you endured for us, of all that you gave up, of the pain of those who loved you, here on earth, their tears joined by those of the angels who sang at your birth and now mourn unseen above the cross. We dare not think of the heart broken so deliberately by God, the Father and Creator, the Mother of all that came to pass, whose love dared to throw the dice in a universe that was fractured, to heal the breaking apart in the adherence of love applied to all surfaces. Only you could do this for God, for us, for the world. For those who bore the pain with you and for those who would grow into new life beyond the pain of second birth. Here we lay down our hearts and our souls upon the sacred blood-soaked earth at this centre point of possibility. And here we will stay until the hour has passed and the future is set free of the prison of the past. For once... For all. Glory and honour, praise and thanksgiving originate in this moment of intense sorrow and unbreakable hope. 
may it all accrue to the balance of love. In your holy name. Amen. We read from John's Gospel. John chapter 18 beginning at verse 9. Verse 1, sorry, and all the way to the end of chapter 19. After Jesus had said this prayer, he left with his disciples and went across Kidron Brook. There was a garden in that place, and Jesus and his disciples went in. Judas the traitor knew where it was, because many times Jesus had met there with his disciples. So Judas went to the garden taking with him a group of Roman soldiers and some temple guards sent by the chief priests and the Pharisees. They were armed and carried lanterns and torches. Jesus knew everything that was going to happen to him, so he stepped forward and asked them, Who is it that you're looking for? Jesus of Nazareth, they answered. I am here, he said. Judas the traitor was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they moved back and fell to the ground. Again, Jesus asked them, Who is it that you're looking for? Jesus of Nazareth, they said. I have already told you that I am here, Jesus said. If then you are looking for me, let these others go. He said this so that what he had said might come true. Father, I have not lost even one of those whom you gave me. Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave, cutting off his right ear. The name of the slave was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back in its place. Do you think that I will not drink the cup of suffering which my father has given me? Then the Roman soldiers with their commanding officer and the Jewish guards arrested Jesus, tied him up and took him first to Annas. He was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jewish authorities that it was better that one man should die for all the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. That other disciple was well known to the high priest, so he went with, in with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest's house, while Peter stayed outside by the gate. Then the other disciple went back out, spoke to the girl at the gate and brought Peter inside. The girl at the gate said to Peter, Aren't you also one of the disciples of that man? No, I'm not, answered Peter. It was cold, so the servants and guards had built a charcoal fire and were standing around it, warming themselves. So Peter went over and stood with him, warming himself. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I've always spoken publicly to everyone. All my teaching was done in the synagogues and in the temple where all the people come together. I've never said anything in secret. Why then do you question me? Question the people who heard me. Ask them what I told them. They know what I said. When Jesus said this, one of the guards there slapped him and said, How dare you talk like that to the high priest? Jesus answered him, If I've said anything wrong, tell everyone here what it was. But if I am right in what I have said, why do you hit me? Then Annas sent him, still tied up, to Caiaphas, the high priest. Peter was still standing there, keeping himself warm. So the others said to him, Aren't you also one of the disciples of that man? But Peter denied it. No, I'm not, he said. One of the high priest's slaves, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, spoke up. Didn't I see you with him in the garden, he asked. Again, Peter said no and at once a rooster crowed. Early in the morning, Jesus was taken from Caiaphas' house to the governor's palace. The Jewish authorities did not go inside the palace, for they wanted to keep themselves ritually clean in order to be able to eat the Passover meal. So Pilate went outside to them and asked, What do you accuse this man of? Their answer was, We would not have brought him to you if he had not committed a crime. Pilate said to them, Then you yourselves take him and try him according to your own law. They replied, We are not allowed to put anyone to death. This happened in order to make come true what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he would die. Pilate went back into the palace and called Jesus. Are you the king of the Jews? he asked him. 
Jesus answered, does this question come from you or have others told you about me? Pilate replied, do you think I'm a Jew? It was your own people and the chief priests who handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus said, my kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom belonged to this world, my followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish authorities. No, my kingdom does not belong here. So Pilate asked him, are you a king then? Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. I was born and came into this world for this one purpose, to speak about the truth. Whoever belongs to the truth listens to me. And what is truth? Pilate asked. Then Pilate went back outside to the people and said to them, I cannot find any reason to condemn him. But according to the custom you have, I always set free a prisoner for you during the Passover. Do you want me to set free for you the king of the Jews? They answered him with a shout, No, not him. We want Barabbas. Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him whipped. The soldiers made a crown out of thorny branches and put it on his head. Then they put a purple robe on him and came up to him and said, Long live the king of the Jews. And they went up and slapped him. Pilate went back out once more and said to the crowd, Look, I will bring him out here to you to let you see that I cannot find any reason to condemn him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Look, here is the man. When the chief priests and the temple guards saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, you take him then and crucify him. I find no reason to condemn him. The crowd answered back, we have a law that says he ought to die because he claimed to be the son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid. He went back into the palace and asked Jesus, where do you come from? But Jesus did not answer. Pilate said to him, you will not speak to me? Remember, I have the authority to set you free and also to have you crucified. Jesus answered, you have authority over me only because it was given to you by God. So the man who handed me over to you is guilty of a worse sin. When Pilate heard this, he tried to find a way to set Jesus free. But the crowd shouted back, if you set him free, that means you're not the emperor's friend. Anyone who claims to be a king is a rebel against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he took Jesus outside and sat down on the judge's seat in the place called the Stone Pavement. In Hebrew, the name is Gabbatha. It was then almost noon of the day before the Passover. Pilate said to the people, here is your king. They shouted back, kill him, kill him, crucify him. Pilate asked them, do you want me to crucify your king? The chief priests answered, the only king we have is the emperor. Then Pilate handed Jesus over to them to be crucified. So they took charge of Jesus. He went out carrying his cross and came to the place of the skull, as it is called. In Hebrew, it is called Golgotha. There they crucified him. And they also crucified two other men, one on each side with Jesus between them. Pilate wrote a notice and had it put on the cross, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews, is what he wrote. Many people read it because the place where Jesus was crucified was not far from the city. The notice was written in Hebrew, Latin and Greek. The chief priest said to Pilate, do not write the King of the Jews, but rather this man said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written stays written. After the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took the robe, which was made of one piece of woven cloth, without any seams in it. The soldiers said to one another, let's not tear it, let's throw dice to see who will get it. This happened in order to make the scripture come true. They divided my clothes among themselves and gambled for my robe. And this is what the soldiers did. Standing close to Jesus' cross were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. 
Jesus saw his mother and the disciple he loved standing there. So he said to his mother, he is your son. Then he said to the disciple, she is your mother. From that time, the disciple took her to live in his home. Jesus knew that by now everything had been completed. And in order to make the scripture come true, he said, I'm thirsty. A bowl was there full of cheap wine, so a sponge was soaked in the wine, put on a stalk of hyssop and lifted up to his lips. Jesus drank the wine and said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Then the Jewish authorities asked Pilate to allow them to break the legs of the men who had been crucified and to take the bodies down from the crosses. They requested this because it was a Friday and they did not want the bodies to stay on the crosses on the Sabbath since the coming Sabbath was especially holy. So the soldiers went and broke the legs of the first man and then the other man who had been crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus they saw that he was already dead. So they did not break his legs. One of the soldiers, however, plunged his spear into Jesus' side and at once blood and water poured out. The one who saw this happen has spoken of it, so that you may also believe. What he said is true and he knows that he speaks the truth. This was done to make the scripture come true. Not one of his bones will be broken. And there is another scripture that says people will look at him whom they pierce. After this, Joseph, who was from the town of Arimathea, asked Pilate if he could take Jesus' body. Joseph was a follower of Jesus, but in secret, because he was afraid of the Jewish authorities. Pilate told him he could have the body, so Joseph went and took it away. Nicodemus, who had at first gone to see Jesus at night, went with Joseph, taking with him about 100 pounds of spices, a mixture of myrrh and aloes. The two men took Jesus' body wrapped it in linen cloths with the spices according to the Jewish custom of preparing a body for burial. There was a garden in the place where Jesus had been put to death and in it there was a new tomb where no one had ever been buried. Since it was the day before the Sabbath and because the tomb was close by, they placed Jesus' body there. Amen. May God add his blessing to this reading from his holy word. To his name be praise and glory. Our readings today are full of fear. Fear drove most of what happened on that first Good Friday. The chief priests were afraid of what Jesus might be and of the effect he would have on the people. So afraid that they took this good man who was so much more than that and handed him over to the Roman governor. So afraid that they bribed one of the disciples and then went on to bribe others to lie about what Jesus had said. They used every dirty trick in the political book, things they would never have stooped to if they had not been terrified of the consequences. Even the consequence that Jesus might indeed be God's Messiah. Fear makes people dangerous, and a cornered animal is the most dangerous type, especially a human one. Fear shows differently in different people. Some lash out, some lie, some plot a way out, some react with calm in the worst of all situations. In our story, only Jesus acted out of a place of calm, because only Jesus knew what was truly happening. Only Jesus saw the whole picture, and he was not obliged to share it with anyone else. He had taken the time to explain it to his friends and his disciples in the weeks before, but few of them had the capacity to understand as yet. Peter should have been stronger. Indeed, he started off stronger as he drew a sword in the dark garden and cut off the ear of one of the high priest's slaves. But Jesus told him to put down the sword and rebuked him. Put your sword back in its place. Do you think that I will not drink the cup of suffering which my father has given me? Put your sword back in its place. This was not the place for anyone else to get in the way. 
Peter, his actions rejected, found nothing else to do but follow on behind the arresting party as they went first to Annas at the high priest's house. The disciple along with Peter had better social connections and he could get Peter in with him, into that cold courtyard, past the first person who asked Peter if he knew Jesus too. The first moment of fear for himself took Peter into his second betrayal of the night. First the sword, now the self-serving lie. A second lie would follow as Peter waited anxiously, and a third as a relative of the wounded slave thought that Peter might look just a bit familiar. Three times Peter's fear got the better of him, and all for nothing. The high priest had his own agenda of letting Jesus die rather than letting any others die at the hands of the Romans. Better than one man, better that one man should die. Even if it was wrong, this is the fear of the ruling priest coming to the surface. And the decisions of a wise ruler doing the necessary thing, not the right thing. God help him. Jesus was taken to Pilate because the high priest's plan was to have him executed by Rome. Then no blame would accrue to the religious authorities, only gratitude from Rome for handing over a troublemaker. Now Caiaphas's only fear was that Pilate would not take the bait, so he salted the crowd with his own people. Outside a new fear overtook Peter as he realised he could no longer look Jesus in the face. He had betrayed him three times. Even Judas had only betrayed him once. Peter feared his place as a disciple was now lost to him and any claim to living as anything other than a failed fisherman. Pilate did not expect what he found in Jesus. He expected a rebel against Rome or at least a murderer. Instead, here was someone innocent of all he had been accused of. Someone who would not engage in anything that saved him from this dangerous situation. For Jesus would not help Pilate with his decisions or with his fear. Pilate was caught between the rock of his fear and the hard place of the people he ruled. They wanted Jesus gone and they were using Rome's representative as a tool to get it done. Pilate tried. He tried to understand who this was in front of him. But when Jesus would not help himself, Pilate could do no more. Listening to the crowd's rejection of their own laws and their faith in that moment when they declared that they had no king but Caesar, Pilate gave in to the greater of his fears, the fear of losing control of the situation. He gave the order and handed Jesus over to be scourged and crucified but there was one act of defiance left for Pilate. He insisted on his own notice for the cross. Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews, is what he wrote. The notice was written in Hebrew, Latin and Greek. The chief priest said to, the Pil to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but rather this man said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written stays written. Pilate found his courage to make it clear that he did not think this was right and that he understood what the Jewish authorities were doing even if his hands were so tied that he could not avoid the end that Jesus knew was coming. I think Pilate might have been looking for the truth for the rest of his life. Some others found their courage too. For standing near the cross were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. Jesus saw his mother and the disciple he loved standing there. One of the last sights of Jesus' life on earth were these people who loved him enough to go right to the end with him. Despite the danger, despite the disgrace, despite their desperate sadness, he was not alone in the moment of death. And later in the day, he was taken down from the place of torture and death by two more who had found their courage. Joseph and Nicodemus went to Pilate 
to ask permission to take the body down. Coming out of the shadows into the place of powerlessness, power, the place of powerlessness to help power. They gave Pilate another moment of choice. Pilate chose to help them and gave permission. So Joseph and Nicodemus went themselves and took Jesus' body and wrapped it in linen with the burial herbs and spices and laid him to rest in an unused tomb nearby. A last act of defiance, of love, to stand against the hatred and the fear which had characterised the day that had now passed. Joseph and Nicodemus chose now to come out of the shadows. If they had come sooner, they might have ended up dead themselves, on the wrong side of a Jewish council's decision. Fear kept them immobile and silent, but grief gave them the strength at last. There's nothing simple about this account of the crucifixion. Nothing simple and nothing easy. Those who rush their way from Palm Sunday to Easter morning miss the dark heart that gives birth to the light. The hatred and fear that turns to grief and the determination of love that will be reborn into joy. We leave this place tonight with the determination of those who have been at the foot of the cross. The determination to follow to the end and beyond. May God grant us the first sight of the light of Easter and the full heart of wondering love that greets Jesus in the garden now and always. Amen. Janet Morley's poem for the day is Good Friday 1613 Riding Westward by John Donne. Let man's soul be a sphere and then in this the intelligence that moves devotion is and as the other spheres by being grown subject to foreign motions lose their own and being by others hurried every day scarce in a year their natural form obey. Pleasure or business, so our souls admit for their first mover and are whirled by it. Hence is't that I am carried towards the west this day when my soul's form bends towards the east. There I should see a sun by rising set and by that setting endless day beget but that Christ on this cross did rise and fall. Sin had eternally benighted all. Yet dare I almost be glad. I do not see that spectacle of too much weight for me. Who sees God's face, that is self-life, must die. What a death were it then to see God die? It made his own lieutenant nature shrink. It made his footstool crack and the sun wink. Could I behold that endless height which is zenith to us and our antipodes humbled below us or that blood which is the seat of all our souls if not of his? Made dirt of dust or that flesh which was worn by God for his apparel ragged and torn. If on these things I durst not look, durst I upon his miserable mother cast mine eye, who was God's partner here, and furnished thus half of that sacrifice which ransomed us. Though these things, as I ride, be from mine eye, they are yet present to my memory, for that looks towards them, and thou lookst towards me, O Saviour, as thou hangst upon the tree. I turn my back to thee, but to receive corrections till thy mercies bid thee leave. O think me worth thine anger, punish me, burn off my rusts and my deformity, Restore thine image so much by thy grace that thou mayst know me and I'll turn my face.
let us pray. At the ending of Good Friday, dear Lord, we turn our faces to you and to the darkness waiting to cocoon you in the tomb that is also the chamber bearing new life forth into the world. We have no words, but our souls resonate with the echoes of your love, which brought into the world all the possibilities of heaven on earth. Here we leave you in our minds, only to find you in our hearts, walking with us as we have walked with you through Holy Week and beyond it to the hope of all that is to come. All glory, praise and thanksgiving be yours, Lord of the universe and Lord of our hearts. Amen. Go now in peace, into the darkness of Good Friday and towards the light to come and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you this day and forevermore. Amen.